A warm welcome to everybody present already. We will wait a moment and start soon. Thank you for your patience. Good afternoon. Um, before we start the online event, we want to provide some technical information. This online event will be held in English and French with a simultaneous interpretation. In order to listen to the English interpretation, do the following. Go with your mouse to the taskbar and click on the symbol globe. Now you can cho choose either English or French or original sound. In case you choose the original sound, you will listen to the speakers in the language they speak. Fatou? Merci, Andreas. Bonjour et bienvenue à tous. Avant de commencer l'événement en ligne. Uh, thank you, Andreas. Uh, before we start, we would like to provide you with a few uh, technical items. This online conference in English and French will be interpreted simultaneously. In order to listen to the English translation, please do click on the small globe and then choose the language you wish to listen to, English or French, or the original sound. If you select original sound, you will listen to the uh, various languages spoken by the moderator and presenters. Externalizing EU borders, Frontex and other European security actors in West Africa. Um, welcome to all the participants and especially uh, to our wonderful speakers whom I ask to switch on their cameras so that we can see you in the beginning all. Um, my name is Andreas. I work as field officer for migration at the Berlin-based NGO uh, Brot für die Welt, Bread for the World. And many of our partners in the Global South are negatively affected by externalization policies of the EU. And at the same time, they are fighting against these practices. Um, one of them is Mokhtar Anjaye from Alam von Sahara, who, who will speak later um, this afternoon. And I'm very honored to co-host uh, the event today with Fatou Faye, who is sitting in Dakar. Fatou? Voilà. Uh, ce travail n'a pas seulement été effectué avec uh, ceux qui sont là, mais surtout avec uh, l'organisation. Various people have contributed to uh, this uh, conference, Bread for the World, Migrations Control Info, and collectively joined with the third round of organizers, as well as Migration Control, and other activists, journalists, translators, researchers, and anti-racism organizations from Europe and Africa working on this externalization of border control. My name is Fatou and I am program officer at the RLS office in West Africa. We work together with various organizations, activists and researchers who work towards protecting migrants' rights. Um, speak about the schedule of to the, uh, today. So we are holding this event in uh, very challenging times, I would say. Looking at the media, the EU threatens to become a single issue institution. So, And its only goal seems to be stop migration towards Europe and by doing so denying people on the move even the most fundamental rights. And uh, we are witnessing this strategy not only at the external borders, but the EU is also stepping up its efforts to cooperate with neighboring countries so that they become reliable outposts of the fortress Europe. And we call this externalization. And the recent deal with Tunisia is an example for that, an example that has been and is still very controversially discussed. And our event today focuses on another form of externalization 
that has not got so much public attention so far. Um, we will focus on the activities of Frontex and other European security actors that try to control and stop migration in non-European countries. Although there are very valuable reports and articles tackling this issue, we have the feeling that most of us still lack a proper overview about questions such as, such as where are Frontex and other European security actors deployed in third countries? What is exactly their mandate and what are they doing? Um, we will tackle these questions today, focusing on a specific region, uh, West Africa. We have chosen uh, this regional focus because on the one hand, two of the three organizations that are organizing the event this evening, um, they have a focus on West Africa or are even based there. On the other hand, Frontex itself has focused on the region in the last years, and the EU also wants uh, two West African states, Mauritania and Senegal, to sign status agreements with Frontex. When we planned this event, we had three goals in mind. First, to provide general information on this type of externalization. Second, to shed lights on the effects of these activities in specific countries. And third, to discuss strategies, how we can critically, critically engage with this form of externalization. And for this task, we have invited activists, academics, and politicians from both West Africa and Europe to provide us with inputs. And you can um, all see them here now. And we are very, really very, very thankful that uh, all of you have accepted um, the invitation. Before I pass over to you, uh, let's have a very brief look uh, on the agenda. So I'll try to share my screen. Um, yeah, so we, the introduction that's now, then um, um, as an important starting point for our discussion, we will have inputs by Mariana uh, Gliati and Jane Kilpatrick. They will provide us with general a general overview um, which European security actors are controlling migration in West Africa, what is their exact mandate, and what do we know specifically on the role of Frontex. Afterwards, uh, Leonie Yekin and Hassan Mokta will shed light on two specific country contexts, Mauritania and Senegal. As I mentioned before, it is these two countries that the EU wants to sign status agreements uh, with Frontex. And this would intensify already existing forms of cooperation in controlling migration in and from these two countries. Um, after these two deep dives, we will discuss uh, with Tineke Strick from the European Parliament. What possibilities does the European Parliament have to control and perhaps also to stop the activities of Frontex and other European security actors in West Africa? And how does she assess them from a human rights perspective? The last two inputs come from two activists, Mokta Danyaye from Niger and Salio Diouf from Senegal. Salyu just organized an anti-Frontex conference in Dakar and will speak about how civil society in Senegal is confronting Frontex. And Mokta will do the same for Niger, but of course we'll also tackle the recent coup d'etat in Niger and how it might change the migration regime in the country. After these inputs, the speakers will react on your comments and questions. Um, Unfortunately, no direct interventions, intervention will be possible, but we encourage you to post your comments in the chat. If you have questions to the speakers, please use the Q&A tool um, and please also indicate to whom uh, you direct the question. Uh, we will collect your comments and questions and forward them to the speakers and please uh, be respectful in your post. We will not tolerate any offensive posts, any racist or sexist comments. So on the last technical note, um, we will also um, we record this event so that um, other people will also have the chance to, to watch it later on. Um, so then I think we are prepared now to start. And uh, let's start with the first inputs of uh, Mariana and uh, Jane. Um, who will do a kind of mapping of the activities of Frontex and other European security actors targeting migration in, in West Africa. Uh, Mariana Gliati, um, um, she has, she's working on the Tilburg University and holds a PhD from Leiden University. 
she, she has published widely on the subject of our discussion today. So on Frontex and also its role in externalization and the European migration regime to West Africa. Um, and she has published uh, academic articles as well as reports for the Libe Committee um, of the European Parliament or State Watch. And much of this work has been the result of a result of a very productive cooperation with our second speaker, Jane Kilpatrick. Uh, Jane was a researcher at the State Watch for three and a half years, where she looked into the mandate, action, and accountability of Frontex in different contexts. And other fields of uh, her research include torture and anti-torture policy policies. And um, we asked Mariana and Jane to focus our input on the following questions. Which European security actors are part of EU's externalization strategy in West Africa? What do they exactly do there? What is their mandate? And what is also the legal base for their work? Um, so Mariana, I think you will start. The word is yours. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you all very much for the invitation. I hope you can hear me all right. Um, Jane will uh, be sharing the slides. Uh, Jane, if you could also go on full screen for the slides. Perfect. So um, I'd like to start by saying that border externalization, actually, even saying that border externalization has a detrimental impact upon human rights has become such a, a commonplace statement, a, a sort of ordinary remark. Still, the EU continues and escalates the closed borders policy, including outsourcing border management to, to non-EU countries, especially in Africa. And from this, multi-actor forms of cooperation emerge, which include state and non-state actors. Now, existing research, especially legal research, primarily focuses on border externalization in the Maghreb. Well, West Africa, we also had heard it from Andreas uh, earlier, is that greatly neglected in comparison. This is why we're most happy with this gathering today. And it's most neglected if we take into account how crucial the region is, including uh, many important transit and refugee producing countries, uh, top development aid re recipients. Amongst the five priority countries for the EU Security Migration Development Corporation, we have four West African countries, so four out of the five. Next slide, please. During our research on the work of Frontex in Mali and Niger, and Jane will tell you more about it in a bit, we also tried to map out the relevant Western actors that are active in the region, or at least that was our intention, but this proved to be a rather impossible task. The stakeholders themselves seem to not have a good overview, and the playfield seemed to be constantly shifting. So no one had up-to-date information on who was on the ground, not to mention the labyrinth that is the funding allocation in this area. So the best we can do today is provide you with an, an incomplete indication of the plethora of the different actors that are involved in West Africa, constituting the migration security nexus in border management. Now we can speak of this next because the different border management activities are often difficult to distinguish. Um, take, for example, the mandate of EU Cup Sahel, which is initially focusing on counterterrorism and organized crime and has now been extended to the management of the borders, including migration movement. And I mentioned before that the play field has been constantly changing. West Africa remains an extremely volatile region. Many Western actors have left Mali after the last coup d'etat. ECOWAS is now threatening military intervention in Niger. The public sentiment is becoming increasingly anti-Western or at least anti-French. Next slide. France has... Uh, 1,500 troops in Niger, supported by drones and planes. It has had counterinsurgent troops in West Africa, actually, for the last decade. But as a result of the military coups in Mali in 2021 and Burkina Faso in 2022, it retracted its troops from these countries and collected the bulk of its forces to Niger. Trying to combat the anti-French sentiment there as well, France had already started before even the coup in Niger, moving towards less Western boots on the ground, ground and rather focusing on supporting local forces. Now, 
Uh, this summer, the military junta in Niger revoked its military agreements with France and ordered the French ambassador to leave. The ambassador finally returned to France at the end of September, and France announced a few days ago that the end of its cooperation with Niger and military presence there will be withdrawn. Actually, it has already started. Um, it, it announced the removal of its soldiers by the end of the year. And this marks the end of an era, actually, for French military intervention in its former colonies. According to the latest information that I have, France still remains uh, maintains military bases in Chad, and that is its last military base in the Sahel, in Ivory Coast, Senegal, and Gabon. And the tendency is again to focus on co-managing operations with local forces. Next slide. Spain has also significant influence in um, joint investigation teams, Spanish and French police have worked together with Nigerian police in combating smuggling and trafficking. The Spanish Guardia Civil uh, is implementing transnational coordinated border control projects and infrastructures in North and West Africa, including the Seahorse projects, which are interregional cooperation projects, including operational cooperation, uh, stemming from the global approach to migration. And we also have the Garci Sahel program aiming to guarantee stability and the fight against terrorism and organized crime in the Sahel. The project that that project is directed by the Guardia Civil, but also involves the French National Gendarmerie, the Italian police force and the Republican National Guard of Portugal. And I mentioned Italy. When we were conducting our research in Niger, we also heard of Italian police. And it turns out that Italy indeed had 300 soldiers in Niger before the coup. Last August, Italy announced that 65 of its soldiers had left Niger and the rest deployed to remain for counterinsurgency and military training missions. Next slide, please. Uh, Germany has been active in Mali in the context of the UN peacekeeping mission uh, MINUSMA, um, but has, as of the end of September, also been withdrawing its troops from, from Mali. Um, and it's unclear to me if some of the troops will stay. The, we have the, the German Agency for International Cooperation, the Deutsche Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit, that works with African states in the area of migration governance. Um, for example, GIS has had an office in Niger's capital in Yemen since 1968, and following the coup in July, all bilateral development cooperation with Niger was suspended. Uh, Germany also has migration and border management liaison offices in EMA and police offices at EU Cap Sahel, Niger. The US also operates two bases in uh, Niger, and they also have established a separate US high command for the African continent, AFRICOM, that is based in Stuttgart. Next slide, please. Um, we also have larger international missions. MINUSMA is the most well-known one, uh, well -known one uh, the peace mission in Mali. It began in 2013 and grew out of a French military intervention um, and now has uh, risen to the most important um, peacekeeping mission in the area. You can see, thank you, Andreas, you can see the uh, rest of the missions there. The EU is, of course, implementing various forms of operational cooperation through the Migration Partnership Framework. Uh, we also have, there is enhanced cooperation return readmission. EU development aid is um, uh, also used for migration control purposes. In the Migration Pact, the EU affirmed its intention to intensify cooperation in third countries. Frontex there would have a central role. Um, we also have several. Uh, C CSDP missions, common security and defense policy, such as EU Cap Sahel in Niger and EU Cap Sahel Mali uh, since 2012 and 2015 accordingly. And last August, the Council adopted a decision on a European Union security and defense initiative in support of West African countries in the Gulf of Guinea. And as part of it, of this, a, a new common security defense policy mission is planned to be deployed in Benin and Ghana and possibly also expanded in other West African states. Next slides. Um, we also have 
if you could uh, go to the next slide. Uh, this is a, a, a bit of an overview of other term, other forms of cooperation, such as bilateral agreements, uh, Spanish investments in uh, Mali, Guinea, uh, Gambia, the Gambia and Ivory Coast, or the emergency transit mechanism uh, from 2017 that focused on evacuating migrants from detention centers in Libya to Niger. Um, and then, of course, we have the return partnership, um, the EU seeks partnership with Nigeria with respect to return and readmission, but Nigeria, which also has a large diaspora community in Europe, has been resisting formal agreement for years. Um, in, the last, in the next slide, you'll see a... a an overview of agreements that uh, Nigeria also has, uh, already has bilateral agreements. And of course, we have involvement of the IOM with several projects, including return and development cooperation. Um, if you would like to go to the last slide, I would like to stop by pointing out that the discontent with the Western partners is growing and also France's influence is declining. Um, as this happens, China is gradually becoming more attractive partner and China Africa security uh, military cooperation is growing and China has concrete also aspirations for larger uh, global governance, which also includes a China Africa peace and security policy. Uh, Russia has been partnering up with Africa since the last uh, since 2015, have several military uh, agreements and the Wagner Group is active in the area as well. And in this picture, you can see also Russian flags flown during the march of supporters in the coup last July, um, indicative of the appeal of Russia as a security partner. I will hand over to Jane. Thank you. Um, yes, so I'll talk a little bit more about um, the research that we've been uh, undertaking and how we've focused. Um, so uh, our research, um, supported by the Transnational Institute and State Watch, um, considers the externalization of the EU's borders via the work of Frontex, um, focusing on the case studies of Mali and Niger. Um, we worked, I think it's important to say, also with a team of researchers who conducted um, interviews. Um, so we also worked with uh, and are still working with Niv Nivreen at the Transnational Institute uh, and with Rumo Chiluta, Amami Sila, Katia Gir and Oriol Kuch. Um, and we uh, and since we've conducted our interviews and our desk analysis, um, our analysis is focused on human rights accountability and the continuation of colonial dynamics by European actors in the region. Um, so we consider differing political priorities, including the ECOWAS free movement zone, as well as economic goals, such as the impact of remittances um, versus, for example, um, European development aid. Um, yeah, so to give a brief background of Frontex and its work outside the EU, um, just a, a very brief overview of the agency. Um, it was founded in 2004 um, as an agency. Sorry. Sorry, I have nothing. Thought... Please continue. <laughs> Uh, founded in 2004 as an agency to coordinate the border management activities of EU member states. Um, since then, it's had four expansions of its mandate, giving it greater powers with further reach. And it's also become the EU's most highly funded agency. Uh, its annual budget for last year was 754 million euros. Um, in terms of its activities outside the EU's borders, um, before this became part of the agency's governing regulation, Frontex did work with states outside the EU, but only under the direction of an EU member state, which had a bilateral agreement with another state. Um, so, for example, this was the case with Senegal and Mauritania's participation in the Frontex coordinated operation HERA, um, which launched in 2006. Um, but it was the 2011 amendment um, to the Frontex regulation which introduced more direct cooperation. Um, a new regulation in 2016 gave Frontex the competence to launch operations under status agreements in non-EU states, um, as long as they shared a border with an EU state. Um, and this option led to the signing of status agreements between the EU and Western Balkan states, um, under which Frontex has launched border surveillance, land and sea operations. Um, and it was another new regulation in 2019 that expanded the possibility of conducting operations outside the EU to any state anywhere in the world. Um, so besides 
joint operations under status agreements, uh, the agency may also launch um, and finance technical assistance projects in countries outside the EU and provide other operational and technical assistance relevant to uh, returns. Um, it can deploy its statutory staff and other experts such as liaison officers there and exchange information with non-EU countries in the framework of Eurosur and risk analysis networks. Um, so looking more specifically at Frontex's activities in West Africa, um, this has increased alongside uh, EU concern about the potential impact of security risks on potential migration towards its own external borders. Um, so it's at Frontex's activities in intelligence gathering, relationship and capacity building across North and West African region, regions has also been seen to spread in this time scale. Um, specifically in 2010, Frontex launched the Africa Frontex Intelligence Community or AFIC to facilitate capacity building cooperation on deportations from the EU and information exchange on migrant smuggling, cross-border crime and ooh, modi operandi and risk analysis. Um, central elements of the AFIC network are the risk analysis cells, which are offices run by partner states border management authorities, but with equipment, training and the setting up of integrated border management systems provided by Frontex. Uh, so, Sorry, just checking which slide I'm on. Um, yeah, so the agency's growing commitment to establishing a presence in multiple countries, um, including working re uh, re uh, agreements with EU missions alongside the Pact on Asylum and Migration, um, published first in 2020, these indicate a much more operational um, plan for the future. Um, so, for example, the scoping missions conducted in 2022 by Frontex in Senegal and Mauritania um, have led to the authorization by the Council um, to open negotiations on status agreements um, that we'll hear a lot more about in the future sessions. Um, so I probably don't have time to go too much over um, all of the legal criticisms that we have developed in our analysis, but I think um, specifically to Frontex, these um so i think we'll probably discuss much more its role in externalized border management so perhaps yeah for now i'll focus more on the frontex um concerns around how it's growing mandate and resources and not matched for example with the full staffing of the fundamental rights office uh the full involvement of the fundamental rights officer in uh um in plans and operational plans outside of the eu um and more concerningly um examples that the Fundamental Rights Office and the Consultative Forum have been ignored um, by planning. Um, ongoing issues with transparency at Frontex, specifically that residents and citizens of countries outside the EU don't have the same rights to access documents as um, citizens of the EU, um, and the legal immunity um, proposed under status agreements. Um, so yeah, I will leave the rest perhaps for the Q&A as I think we are well out of time. Um, but there will also be more detail coming up in uh, an upcoming article in the Movements Journal. Um, and our um, research report um, with Transnational Institute and State Watch should be published um, pretty soon and we'll have a lot more detail in there. So yeah, looking forward to the session. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, Jane and uh, Mariana. And this was a good uh, start for um, uh, our discussion. And the interpreters asked me to tell uh, all the speakers to speak a bit slower. Otherwise, interpretation is really hard to do. And then I hand over to Fatou and the next speakers. Fatou. Merci, Andreas, et merci à Jane et Mariana pour ces brillantes... Thank you to Mariana and um, Jane for their input. I will now uh, introduce Leonie, who, holds a P who is doing her PhD in Amsterdam and had a scholarship from the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. Um, until December 2022. She was also affi an affiliate to the University of Dakar in Senegal. Her research focuses on the intertwined colonial continuities and racial capitalism with the production of migration governance in the context of migration control as 
dictated internally and externally when it comes to governance against smuggling in Senegal. Eight minutes, I want to underline eight minutes only. Uh, she will share with us the result of her research about the activity of uh, European security actors in the different countries, such as Senegal and their implications for the people um, who are migrating and societies uh, as a whole. The floor is yours. Thank you, Fatou. Can you see uh, my screen? Yes. Yes, we can see your screen. Um, thank you so much for the introduction, Fatou. Given the time constraints, I will answer the three questions in the most selective, but hopefully equally concise manner, drawing on three key trends that I discerned throughout my research on EU-Senegalese border work. I will consider the most relevant security actors involved in Senegal by looking at the contested geographical stretching of European border and, in, and the institutional deeping of EU-Senegalese border work. Then I turn to the trends on the national level by looking at border work in Senegal as an internationalized field. And I will conclude with some observations on the impacts of EU-funded projects and cooperation. So to turn to the first question, I would zoom into the Senegalese maritime border, where European and Senegalese joint border control have both been ongoing and contested since 2006. In 2006, Senegal was among the first non-EU countries where Frontex became operational through its joint operation HERA, which spanned joint aerial and maritime surveillance of Senegalese territorial waters with the aim of intercepting departures. Operation HERA was stopped in 2019 due to the changed legal framework of the agency in line with its revised 2016 regulation. And this regulation made it necessary to spell out the role and competence of the agency within the mission, in particular in regard to its executive powers. This until then was not the case, as HERA was based on a bilateral agreement between Spain and Senegal. To save the mission, we can deduct from a leaked letter that Frontex proposed to Spain to firstly provide the agency with a bilateral agreement, including the definition of the role of Frontex, as well as an extension of HERA to Spanish territorial waters. These proposals were not accepted by Spain, and the mission ceased to be implemented from 2019 onwards, while the Guardia Civil continues to be present in Senegal. In parallel, EU efforts have been ongoing to conclude a working arrangement with Senegal since 2016, and from 2022, the Commission pushed for the opening of negotiations for a status agreement. And while the previous has illustrated the contested nature of border work at the sea border and the shifting mandate of Frontex, when considering international actors present in Senegal, it is striking that in more recent years, the fight against irregular, sorry, the fight against migrant smuggling has become an increasingly important field of cooperation and framing of border control measures. And you see on the slide a mapping that I did um, in the beginning of my research day in Senegal last year, which maps the different projects that are at the intersection of fighting migrant smuggling and border control. And I do not have the time to go in depth on each project, but I will illustrate some of their key results. At the Senegalese Border Police, a division to fight migrant smuggling was founded in 2018, first with French bilateral support and then supported through EU development funding. EU development funding has also financed the building of seven antennas of this division at border posts across the country. And you see on the slide a photo of one of these construction sites at the border post in Saint-Louis. In the framework of the POC project, 
which stands for Common Operational Partnership, a Spanish liaison officer is stationed at this police division alongside a French colleague, and their presence is aimed at improving information exchange and day-to-day -day police cooperation. The POC project has also resulted in joint investigation among Senegalese and Spanish public prosecutors. Several projects have included workshops and trainings towards law enforcement and public prosecutors, and the latter have highlighted interviews I conducted with them that these trainings made them realize the importance of applying strict measures against smugglers. Further, there is an ongoing legal reform process of the Senegal's, Senegalese legal frameworks on smuggling of migrant and trafficking in human beings carried out with funding from the Netherlands. And in 2018, a high-level regional consultative framework was launched to monitor progress made by West African states on commitments to fight migrant smuggling under the Niamey Conventions. Lastly, a regional project is linking seven similar national projects to the POC, among them the ECI that Mariana also mentioned in her presentation, to build a joint database for investigation creative purposes. These projects mirror the increased relevance given by international, European, and West African actors to carry out border work through fighting migrant smuggling, and by doing so, moving border work more and more within the state to also include judicial actors. And this brings me to my second point, that Senegalese border work has become an internationalized field where ideas, logics, and actors travel and exchange with one another. And one striking example is adoption of the Senegalese strategy against irregular migration. Um, this strategy was adopted earlier this year, and by European and Senegalese actors that I interviewed, it was portrayed as a solely Senegalese initiative. However, many activities of the drafting bodies were funded by European donors. While the policy proposes that what has been termed preventive and restrictive measures, among its many objectives is the building of administrative detention centers at border crossing points. Asking one of the actors involved with the drafting of the strategy, why that was a necessity, they responded that this was the same thing Europe had on Lesbos and hence they would need it as well. And this illustrates how the internationalized field of Senegalese border work has become a field where ideas, logics, actors, as well as financial and material incentives stand in content, constant interaction. And this observation brings me to my last point, the question, what are the consequences? There is recurrent reports on pullbacks and interception resulting in shipwrecks, both at the hands of the Guardia Civil and the Senegalese Navy. Cooperation, negotiations, and projects in the field of migration control are opaque. Freedom of information requests are censored, like this response I got to um, freedom of information requests earlier this year, and Senegalese human rights and migration watchdogs have even more limited access to information. And finally, the deployment of technological assets through European projects, including phone data extraction gear, which you see on this photo, bears the risk of enhancing ongoing political oppression of opposition figures. Thank you so much. Merci, uh, Leonie. Merci pour ces belles analyses. Thank you very much for this highly interesting analysis that was very um, relevant and very impressive. We will now move on to another speaker, Hassanoul Mokhtar. He holds a PhD and he is at the moment carrying researchers in the field of development. Dans le domaine du développement international. Researcher in the field of international development. His research topics are the relationship between migration, border, and development processes, with a regional focus on Mauritania, West African Sahel, and uh, Sahara. Il s'intéresse en particulier à la manière. He focuses most of all on the following question. How is the 
the fact that migration is being made illegal, interacting with a colonial heritage within contemporaneous processes and uh, ever-changing dynamics of displacement. Hassan will tell us about, will provide us with an overview of the activities of European actors in the field of security in the various countries, as well as the role played by uh, those people or the consequences for those people who are on the move and those societies as a whole, also in Mauritania. Hassan, you have the floor, eight minutes. The floor is yours. Okay. Um... Thank you very much, Fatu, and to everybody um, for joining. Uh, I'm going to keep this very brief, but I'm happy to elaborate upon anything that isn't clear in the uh, Q&A. Um, so I'm going to focus mainly on uh, Spain and uh, the EU, given that Frontex is being covered elsewhere, but I can, as I say, uh, cover a bit of the history of Frontex engagement in uh, Mauritania. Um, so as we're all aware, um, Mauritania straddles the Maghreb and uh, the region of West Africa, and for this reason is often viewed as a uh, strategic uh, country within um, the uh, context of externalized migration and border uh, governance. It's often categorized as a transit, transit country, since it's primarily, but not exclusively, uh, non-nationals uh, who have been attempting to reach Europe uh, via its uh, territory. Now, despite the fact that migrations into and out of Mauritania are overwhelmingly regionally oriented, uh, the past 17 years has seen a pretty vast architecture of um, migration and border control uh, efforts um, constructed in Mauritania and off its coast, with the explicit aim of reducing these uh, Europe-bound movements. So in what follows, I'm going to very briefly map and outline the main actors involved in this architecture. Uh, I'll highlight some key developments in its construction, and in doing so, I'm going to try to draw attention to two primary consequences uh, that I view um, of this protest uh, process, rather. Okay, so to just um, set the scene, um, in 2006, the Canary Islands uh, saw more than 32,000 arrivals of people from the coast of West Africa onto its shores. Um, and this results in a, a, a spate of um, policy responses at both Spanish and uh, EU level. I'm just going to draw attention to three um, important uh, responses at the Spanish bilateral level. So first, a um, readmission agreement that had been signed between Spain and, Ma and Mauritania in 2003 becomes a crucial tool of response to these arrivals. And crucially, this agreement allows for the deportation from Spain to Mauritania um, of both Mauritanian nationals and foreign nationals who were judged to have uh, transited through Mauritanian territory to get to Spain. Secondly, uh, the Spanish police and the Spanish uh, Guardia Civil are deployed to the city of uh, Nuadibu, the northern port city of uh, Nuadibu in Mauritania, um, for mig migration control purposes, and remain deployed there to this day through a range of um, memoranda of understanding that are uh, signed between uh, Spanish and the Mauritanian security forces. Thirdly, a detention center is constructed by Spanish soldiers in April 2006 in Nuadibu with funding from the Spanish Agency for International Cooperation and Development. And as uh, a result of all of uh, these um, measures, the first consequence that I'd like to emphasize uh, can, is evidence, namely a sharp rise in deportations from Mauritanian state territory between 2005 and 2006, and the introduction of uh, the experience of what Nicola, Nicolas de Geneva calls uh, deportability um, as a social condition in Mauritania. Okay, so as the arrivals uh, in Spain begin to diminish after these measures are put in place, the EU begins to take on a more direct role in reshaping the migration policy landscape in Mauritania. It does so primarily through um, a national development, uh, national migration strategy that is um, adopted in 2010. Uh, the idea here being to render the domain of migration management more comprehensive and uh, holistic. In the process, a host of other actors um, would enter the fold of externalized migration management. Um, 
uh, and they do so as implementing partners of various projects that are envisioned in the National Migration Strategy. So these uh, organizations include uh, ones we've already heard about, um, parastatal organizations like the GIZ or FIAP, um, international organizations like the IOM, the UNHCR, as well as uh, states like Germany, uh, Spain, and, um, and uh, Japan, curiously enough. Um, now, very importantly, at this moment in time, the Mauritanian state's role in upholding the external policy prerogative of policing irregular migration also becomes um, central at this time. This happens primarily with the introduction of a new biometric residence permit for foreign nationals that is introduced in 2012. This is soon followed by regular patrols and raids in migrant neighborhoods and workplaces in Nouakchott, which is the capital of Mauritania, and in Nouadhibou, um, with the purpose of implementing this new um, residence permit um, decision. So basically, if the policy of uh, policing irregular migration and the associated condition of deportability that comes with it, these are originally um, external prerogatives. I, I think that the residence permit um, in 2012 is how it becomes absorbed within Mauritanian state institutions and uh, security practices. So this all means that by the time the EU Trust Fund for Africa is launched in 2015, there is a relative coherence between Mauritanian state actors and the EU around the newfound problem of policing irregular migration. Um, I'm going to assume that people are familiar with the trust fund, but I can explain in the Q&A uh, for those who aren't. So the trust fund represents a significant expansion of externalization in both quantitative and qualitative terms in Mauritania. As regards the latter, um, the migration strategy uh, that I mentioned a moment ago earmarks 12 million worth of uh, migration-related projects over the six years of ex existence. The Trust Fund, on the other hand, financed 84 million worth of projects in 2019 alone. And at the same time, the F Trust Fund has also expanded along qualitative lines um, beyond migration issues kind of strictly understood and encompassing more general border security and counter-terror initiatives like um, ones that Mariana mentioned a moment ago, Garci Rapid Deployment Units, a support program for the G5 Sahel, which is a regional counterterrorism alliance that was established in 2014, whose permanent secretary is based in Nouakchott. And it's this qualitative expansion that I would uh, highlight as the second primary consequence of uh, engagement uh, and externalization in the region, namely a merging of migration control concerns with broader counterterrorism and uh, security uh, issues. So I'm just going to quickly wrap up by situating uh, these two consequences within more recent developments in uh, the region. So on the first consequence, um, last year, the state embarked upon a regularization campaign, removing the fee for residence permits and inviting foreign nationals uh, to obtain it. At the same time, there's been a reported um, increase in policing of the residence permit um, and as a result a uh, reported significant drop in irregular so-called irregular departures from Mauritanian state territory um, meaning that the Mauritanian state is still pretty happy to implement uh, external uh, migration control prerogatives and thus far I think that the domestic stakes uh, for the Mauritanian state are relatively low in uh, filling out uh, this role and cooperating with Spain and the EU on this front, since deporting foreign nationals is a pretty uncontroversial uh, activity uh, in terms of domestic um, politics in Mauritania. Now, this might change in the future, however, as Mauritania is the only country in the G5 Sahel Regional Security Alliance that hasn't seen a coup in recent years. Um, but it has been affected by um, the wave of instability in, uh, in the region, and particularly on its eastern border. Um, and this all means, and I'll finish with this, that the Mauritania's strategic significance for the EU has increased significantly as a result of the wave of anti-French and uh, anti-Western sentiment in the region, which means that the regional stakes of fulfilling this role vis-a-vis -vis the EU may have heightened domestically, but at the same time, its bargaining power and uh, leverage has uh, increased vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the EU um, as well. So I thank you for your uh, attention, and uh, I look forward to any questions or comments. Merci, uh, Magda. Merci bien. Autant pour moi, Hassan. Merci. Merci bien. Thank you very much, Hassan.
Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. And I now give the floor to Andreas. Andreas? Andreas, turn your mic. Sorry, my, my microphone was switched off. So thank you very much, um, uh, Leonie and Hassan, for providing these insights on Senegal and Mauritania. Our next speaker uh, has traveled to both countries this year. As a member of the European Parliament, her aim was to better understand the dynamics, the designing of a status agreement between Frontex and the two countries could unfold. She's one of the public figures in Europe that has been critically engaging with the externalization dynamics of the EU the most, I would say, both as a member of the Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs for the Green Party in the European Parliament, as well as an academic, uh, academic researcher and professor for citizenship and migration law at the Faculty of uh, Law of Redwood University in the Netherlands. Um, of course, I'm talking about Tineke Strick. Tineke, thank you uh, for being here with us today. Um, we have already heard a lot about uh, how Frontex is expanding its area of operation to West Africa. As a consequence, is the European Parliament also expanding its work? So what possibility do you have to control these activities um, in West Africa? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Andreas, also for organizing this uh, very insightful event. Um, yes, we, we, we try to get more grip on, on Frontex extraterritorial activities. And uh, um, Jane was just also explaining uh, the working ag arrangements that have been made and also the AFIC, which actually the AFIC only concerns already 30 countries in the West Africa. These types of operation, cooperation, Frontex has a lot of uh, autonomy in that, and that makes it very difficult for us to really exercise adequate control. Um, uh, the, the, the forms of cooperation where we have most possibilities on is status agreements, because it is an international agreement. Uh, and um, uh, until now, we only have these status agreements with uh, European countries. Uh, so in the Western Balkans, Moldova, uh, but this is the, for the first time that the Commission asked the Council to start negotiations with Mauritania and, and Senegal, so with African countries. Um, when I saw that happening, I thought we really need to be much more on top of that because it will have a lot of more human rights impact uh, implications. We already noticed with the States Agreement with Western Balkan countries, it's very difficult to do something more than only say yes or no in the end. So I proposed that we would make, uh, because normally it's an international agreement, so we have the right to consent, but that's only at the very last stage of the negotiations. Um, well, at the same time, the parliament has the right to be informed at any stage of the negotiations. That's in Article 2, 218 of the uh, Treaty of the TFEU. Um, and I wanted to make sure that I would also, that the European Parliament would also be in a position to come up with concerns, recommendations, give input to the negotiators, because until now only the Council is giving a mandate. So uh, we propose to make an own initiative report um, and I'm Rapporteur for Mauritania, Cornelia Ernst from the left is from Senegal, and this is why the two of uh, us, we went for a working visit. We are now drafting uh, our report and it's negotiated, so we hope that in this way, on the one hand, we have informed the European Parliament much better, but hopefully also for the first time to have some more input in the negotiations uh, with those countries. Okay, thank you, Tineke. Um, I mean, now a question to you as a parliamentarian, but also a professor uh, of law. If we look at the activities of Frontex and a possible status agreement, how do you assess these activities and these plans from a human rights perspective? Yeah, um, <clears throat> if you look at the difference between such a states agreement with a European country, which is a candidate a member state and uh, which also a member of the Council of Europe, you see, although we, you still must be very alert, of course, on what's happening there, but there's much more alignment with the 
human rights safeguards in those countries. If you start negotiating with an African country, you have a completely different legal framework. So that's already the first problem you have to deal with because Frontex in every operational action, it uh, works under the instruction, under the command of the border authorities of that host country. So that will for sure create many more tensions uh, if there's a completely different uh, national legislation and different international uh, uh, legislation. And this is more the theoretical part, but when I went to Mauritania, I also saw uh, a lot of deficiencies in those safeguards. Uh, UNHCR and IOM told us also that you know, after disembarkations, they have now finally got a kind of procedure to be able to identify people's uh, people and also people's need for protection. But there are many raids going on. So very arbitrary uh, apprehensions. Those people are put for a very short time in detention and then expelled to the border or with Mali or with Senegal. So there's no one. Uh, in the possibility to check if they are in need for protection or access to an asylum procedure. Uh, there's also still the slavery model, not, not uh, formally, but in practice, it's very much still there. So it's, uh, there's a lot of discrimination. And um, also Human Rights Watch and, uh, and Amnesty wrote a lot of uh, extensively about the, the human rights uh, violations systematically going on. There's no proper asylum system. Um, so you cannot imagine how Frontex would act there and then still stay in, 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 uh, in compliance with, uh, with the fundamental rights of the EU. I mean, if they have uh, um, uh, intercepted people um, and they you know they 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 are instructed to to send them back to the to the territory or maybe if they start working on the the land border with uh, with the desert uh, in the direction of morocco um there's even no asylum system that they can refer people to uh so um yeah people are really exposed to arbitrariness um, and I cannot imagine how Frontex could, um, you know, could guarantee any compliance with fundamental rights in such a situation. Okay, um, thank you, Tineke. Um, let us try to, to look into, into the future a bit. I mean, uh, I, I, we are witnessing quite different uh, developments at the same time. Um, so do you push us for more externalization? The European Parliament, you, you're quite critical about that. Um, but also the new executive director of Frontex, he raised uh, recently some doubts about future deployments of, of Frontex in the region. And then we also have the Kuse, the data in three West African uh, uh, countries that might also change the cooperation model or cooperation per se. Um, so what what do you think uh, how will the activities of frontex uh, and other security actors evolve in west africa and what must be done not only to witness these the developments but also to actively shape them yeah thanks a lot for for that question indeed the externalization will continue and will be further increased you see it clearly this is the objective of the EU, they, they, they don't manage to find equal responsibility sharing among themselves, so deterring and outsourcing is their main objective. And well, recently we also saw it with Tunisia, uh, where everyone agreed to outsource uh, the protection, despite the huge fundamental rights concerns uh, going on in that country. You also see that von der Leyen has taken more and more the lead in that. She is now reporting to the European Council periodically on all the things that she's doing in that direction. And one of the things she's also mentioning there is to use, make more use of Frontex also in the cooperation with Tunisia, for instance, by uh, making more aerial surveillance uh, above Tunisia by using satellite images, et cetera, et cetera. So, it's indeed true what you said that um, the executive director and also the FRO and even the commission actually, they express some, you know, a lot of doubts as to who could it work actually to be, to have boots on the grounds to be operational in those countries. Um, so it might very well be the case 
that they will not start this real uh, physical deployment, also in order to prevent their own accountability problems, because once you're there physically, you have more responsibility. But I do think that uh, in, in exchange for that, uh, the increase on data uh, uh, sharing, on, on, on remote assistance, on funding, uh, will become more and more uh, um, the type of cooperation. And you also see it already with Libya, for instance, where uh, it has a huge impact on the human rights of people. If, if, if the, the Libyan Coast Guard, and that will definitely also be the same for the Tunisian Coast Guard, will be informed by Frontex, despite it's not a safe port, then people will be intercepted and brought back there. And it's a kind of, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's, 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 they do border control by proxy. And I think in the beginning, indeed, they thought, okay, if we put the agency instead of our own officials, we may, you know, we, we may escape uh, our accountability. But now more and more, I think they see the problem, problematic issues of that. And unfortunately, they have a lot of more possibilities to, to, um, uh, to make sure that those member states you know, comply with what the EU wants. They are funded by it. In many cases, there are hardly any monitoring. Um, yeah, I come to that. <laughs> How are we going to monitor? Uh, we push the Commission and Frontex, of course, to monitor very uh, much better and also to make sure that Frontex has access to all the spots where it has a joint operation. Uh, but I, I think more and more that we should not uh, make, be dependent on what the Commission is doing because they don't have interest in doing a, a transparent monitoring. So I think also with this event, for instance, we really need to build networks with NGOs, with experts on the ground so that we know ourselves better what's going on and how we could, uh, uh, you know, when we should call for suspension or, or how we could make sure that, uh, that we can exercise our, uh, um, our effective control. Uh, one last remark I just heard also from, from the others that getting access to documents is, is really a huge problem in order to get insight into what's happening. For us, it's a bit the same. I also, uh, you know, enter counter that uh, problems. And also in that sense, I think we should do much more within the parliament to make sure that we get the information we want, but we also want to make it publicly accessible so that everyone can follow it and we can have a, a thorough public scrutiny and public debate about this as well. And I also hope in that regard, we will continue our cooperation uh, with civil society experts and uh, everyone working in this field. Thank you so much, uh, very much, uh, Tineke, um, uh, for giving some insights how the European Parliament is trying to follow and to control externalization strategies of Frontex and Co. And thank you also for pointing out the necessity to, to cooperate more closely with activists, uh, academics, etc. in uh, the affected countries. Um, we will now uh, go to two of these activists um, and I'll pass over to Fatou again. Fatou. Thank you, Tineka. Thank you, Andreas. As Andreas suggested, uh, in this second part, we will hand over to activists and we will start with the negotiation part between Senegal and Frontex in order to also get an insight from civil society we have the honor to count amongst us Salou Bounouf who is a senior technician in electromechanics and naval mechanics who became an activist in 2015 by becoming a member of the transnational network Much the Wet Watch the Med Alarm Phone a network that helps people out at sea and in distress on the Mediterranean. Five years later, he came back to Senegal in 2019 to uh, create the, the NGO Bozafi. 
and uh, the aim is to fight for the freedom of people of each and every person and in 2021 he uh, set up a regional team Buzafi, for the alarm phone western med that is called ap dakar alarm phone dakar salut the question we've got for you today how do people view the role of Frontex and other similar actors uh, in your country? So how is it discussed and uh, what should we do in the future? Salut, you've got seven minutes. The floor is yours in order to share your impressions on that question. Salut, are you with us? Can you hear us? Hello, my name is my name is Salu. I founded the NGOs mentioned previously, and uh, I'm a member of the Alarm Phone Network. I am based here in Dakar, and with uh, Buzafi, we work on questions of migration and uh, policy when it comes to migration in Senegal. The question So the sound is uh, difficult. The interpreter is doing her best. So people are starting to hear about Frontex. So we've got negotiations and we don't really talk about what is going on about what this actually means there's very little communication very little information being made accessible i think that also makes it difficult for us uh, to become active and to fight we So people don't feel like they can discuss topics they're not sufficiently informed about, and that makes it all very tricky. With uh, Buzafi, we, we are working with activists and volunteers working around the questions related to migration and the externalization of borders. So we have an idea of what is going on in Senegal with Frontex. People always say Frontex has not been deployed to Senegal, but people like us who can analyze the situation at the borders really observe that there is a presence. And so even if it might not be direct, it's an indirect deployment and all we have to work on is our analysis is what we can observe uh, in the country so we created some initiatives in 2021 we created um, a network concerning the fight against the externalization of borders uh, we have the initiative Ushmak Frontex. And we launched something else that just finished. And what is important is for all of us to work hand in hand and to share our experience in order for people to access information so that we can face Frontex, so that we've got information about the risk that Frontex could be for Senegal, uh, relating to fishing, for instance, and the agreements with uh, neighboring countries, and the restriction of our freedom of movement it's not necessarily directly related to Frontex, 
so but it is all funded by the eu so the presence of the guardia civil is very visible in senegal Two or three times I went to the airport and I saw European agents requiring to see my passport, asking me what I was going to do abroad. So all of this is a form of restriction of our mobility and the freedom of movement of the people in Senegal. So what I can say concerning what we should do is share information. People need access to information. That's what we need to tackle and, and get together to discuss the situation because ever since we uh, have had the pushback against Frontex, we've had many restrictions. There were restrictions, so uh, the Facebook page of Bozafi was taken down or suspended. We were also supposed to negotiate with Medico and all our visa requests were refused. All I was told is I couldn't travel to the Schengen um, space and for security reasons. I've, I don't have any uh, record when it comes to any uh, legal problematic activity. So I don't see why my visa was turned down. So what I'm trying to say Well, this year we are trying to stage another event, and I think that from then on, it's important that we be certain that this fight aims at abolishing completely this alliance with the Frontex, as we saw. And I will stop there. Uh, and I remain available to answer any question. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. The interpreters ask you very kindly to maybe turn off the ventilator because we can um, very clearly hear the sound of the wind. And in order to improve uh, the quality of translation, it would be uh, good to get rid of the sound. Well, Nigeria is one of the Western African countries that is the uh, strongest hit by uh, the uh, developments of um, migration situation. and. It is my great pleasure to welcome here Mokhtar Danyai, who's talking to us. He's in Lampedusa. He is founding member of the organization Alam Konsara, committed to rescuing migrants uh, pushed back to the Sahara from Algeria. And he's also working on documenting violence towards migrants in Nigeria. Mokhtar, welcome. Such a great pleasure to meet you again. Yeah. We have two questions to you. First of all, what is the situation in Niger after the coup? Does it have an impact on the migrant situation in the country? You have four minutes to answer that question. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Fatou. Very pleased to see you again, too, and my warm thanks 
extend to all organizations who took part of this uh, very important event. Gathering researchers, MPs, and activists on the from the field. Before answering your question, I'd like to add up to the explanation uh, from Sahara. Well, this organization Al from Sahara is uh, committed to rescuing people who are pushed back from Algeria, expelled from Algeria, pulled back, and also, and most of all, to the Sahara Desert. And as you said, documenting human rights violations, but also documenting losses, death, cases is very relevant as far as it's uh, until now rather unknown by the international organizations. Well, let's move on to our situation. Four minutes. It's not an easy task, but I'll try to be sen concise and brief. Well, since the 26th of July, uh, the coup that is not the first in the sub-region and probably not the last coup, but that has been extensively covered by the media, uh, had had an extensive media coverage due to the fact that Niger holds lots of uh, resources, mining resources, and also has a strategic geographic situation regarding migration control. And this has an impact as far as there has been strong media coverage on the coup in Niger, but one thing is not being told about, which is that international policies and the European Union are strongly interested in the case of Nigeria and are very much afraid of losing allies that helps them stopping people on their way towards the north. Yes, we've been talking about externalization of European borders and also externalizing human rights violations. And this area in Nigeria, human rights are being violated and all this adds up to a very strong frustration, frustration amongst the population that ends into a coup. So there is a direct link, even if it's difficult to prove it. Well, the current situation is a hard and difficult one for the local population with a very emotional reaction from the ECOWAS. And, uh, that sanctions the population in Nigeria. We see a very strong inflation and the price of uh, basic products. And also, the financial sanction do stop the influx of money because Niger is highly depending on development aid and also support to migrants and to those people who are being stopped. So this has very harsh consequences because the money cannot get into the country. And so there is an increasing amount of migrants entering the country because Algeria constantly pulls back people and uh, deports people to um, Nigeria. Also, since uh, last Thursday, and those sanctions target the state of Nigeria, has a traumatic impact 
onto the local population, but also onto the migrating population, the people that are on the move, escaping from countries and places, and also afraid of that the country might be the target of an attack overnight. And to conclude, I would say that those populations that are on the move, as well as uh, those residing in Niger, are uh, strongly affected. Uh, then, uh, this is a, a situation that is uh, poorly known, hardly known. Well, thank you, Oktar, for this very interesting development. There is a second question about uh, Frontex development. We'd like to ask you. about the cooperation between Frontex and other European players in the field of security prior to the coup. This cooperation, is it to remain the same or is it likely to change after the coup? How do you assess the situation? Well, thank you very much indeed. Frontex, as you said, and uh, the recent agreement, uh, the agreements and the recent developments of the agreements between Frontex and Sahel, UCAP, July 22, dated July 22, but also other agreements we haven't been informed about. Well, how do we assess them? How are they supposed to develop? It's not only about um, a freedom of movement, uh, then, which is a topic addressed by civil society. Well, I think there is a risk uh, that the troops that are not recognized, the military that is not acknowledged by the international community so far, might use their privilege of being in a country of a strategic importance to the European community in order to further negotiate and, as the previous speaker said, ask for foreign troops to leave the country that are Italian and German soldiers among us, others. So we don't know exactly what the trend is, but we fear this might be used from all sides. Um, we are most worried about the right to uh, free movement, and we see that national authorities, national powers and the international community are not solely interested in protecting human rights. The European Union wants, first and foremost, to block the way towards the North and towards the European Union. And even if this includes cooperating with uh, states such as Tunisia and other uh, that do not, that do breach human rights. So this is what we fear. We will look at the situation, wait and see and uh, therefore it is uh, even more important that we remain informed about the developments at political level within Europe, among the researchers and among the activists on the field, so uh, that people may enjoy the, their freedom of movement and Frontex, that is a means of blocking and restricting the people's freedom of movement, may be controlled. At the moment, within Alam Fon Sahara, we have lodged a complaint uh, at uh, the ECOWAS court that hasn't been received because due to the coup, every, everything is on hold at the moment. Uh, merci, Mokta. 
Merci pour cette belle présentation et merci Salut. Thank you Mokta for this uh, input and thank you Salut for this presentation. I'll hand over to Andreas with uh, the rest of the program. Thank you Fatou and thank you uh, Mokdar. I kindly ask all the speakers now to switch on their cameras again as we are coming to the Q&A part. Um, well, this was a tour de force. We have uh, got so much information about very different um, phases of, ex of the externalization uh, policies and practices. So data collection, data co uh, sharing is, is, is one example, but building border posts, another one, um, and the deployment even of uh, security forces in, in West Africa. <laughs> Um, we got some questions and I will direct uh, them um, to the speakers. Please be very brief because we only have half an hour left. Um, so Trini K, there were two questions uh, going uh, coming uh, to you. Um, one was on the informality of agreements. Um, so the question was, is, does the European Parliament has a mechanism to, to effectively mo monitor informal agreements like readmission agreements or can the, 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 the uh, European, European Parliament uh, don't do anything about that? And the second question is from Ignatius Mandu from Nigeria. He said that many NGOs in Nigeria working on migration, that they are cooperating with IOM, uh, which is an externalization actor itself. So how is it possible to for local NGOs uh, to collaborate uh, with you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for those questions. Yes, um, it, it, informal cooperation really makes it even more difficult for us to scrutinize what's going on. Uh, this is why two years ago, the European Parliament, I wrote a report for the European Parliament and it was adopted, where we called for uh, on the human rights aspects of external cooperation. We called for human rights impact assessment prior to starting cooperation, transparent monitoring, um, <clears throat> transparent funding, but also to formalize the cooperation. So in order to make sure there is a democratic and also judicial control, because also judicial, also courts have really difficulties in scrutinizing uh, informal cooperation. Um, but you see the tendency is very much into more informalization. And I must say, uh, if I look at um, monitoring uh, such cooperation, it's even hardly done on formal cooperation. Because sometimes we get reports from the European Commission where they evaluate how these readmission agreements are being implemented. These are the formal ones. But it's, it's really actually very much limited to how many numbers of people have been readmitted, more the technical aspects. But if you talk about what is the impact regarding fundamental rights, have they been you know, readmitted in a safe way? What had happened afterwards? The commission is not interested in it. Um, and for informal agreements, it's even more difficult. Um, so we don't have clear tools, we have to develop our own activities, let's say, so to organize hearings now and then, or to do working visits, but not really formal tools that we can easily uh, use, um, <clears throat> except for funding. If there is funding involved, we have a financial working group which can ask information from the commission, etc. But also there, it's more on a very large scale level, like programs, and not specifically into the you know, the, the more factual implementation of things. So yeah, a lot needs to be improved uh, regarding that. And your other question about IOM, this is a very good question because um, IOM is also very operational. You, you know, they, they, uh, it's also for us very challenging and important to monitor how IOM does its, its job uh, because it's very much involved in huge projects indeed in, in third countries. Uh, but I would really uh, love to also uh, you know, have NGOs that do the uh, factual implementation of these projects to um, reach out to us. And, and I think it would really be great. I mean, I don't think we, I always try to get other MEPs more 
enthusiastic and, 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 and wanting to invest in things. It's not that easy, but I think it would really be very important to go country by country and, and, and organize uh, the NGOs so to, to really have good hearings in order to, to get more information on how things really work out in practice on the ground. So for me, I, I really hope that people will reach out to me because this information is very useful to do our tasks, uh, but there's not a, a, a already a kind of format in which it's done by its own. We really need to take action ourselves. Thank you, Tineke. So on the one hand, we have a lack of information. And at the same time, we have an overload of information because so many things are happening at the same time. So I think what we really lack is a mechanism, as you pointed out, or a platform where we collect this information and also have the resources to then analyze them and and, and get active. I think that's really key. Uh, thank you. Uh, the next question um, um, I want to raise to uh, Hassan. Uh, Hassan. Hassan, there was a question on Frontex involvement in uh, returns from um, uh, deportations from Spain and North African countries. What do you know about that? Okay, thanks um, <clears throat> for the question. I, I can't speak to Frontex's activities on that front in the past three to five years, but um, in the beginning of Operation HERA, uh, which was the operation that was launched uh, by Frontex in 2006, um, it kind of expanded from being initially just a deployment on the Canary Islands that was involved in uh, detaining, apprehending migrants uh, who had recently arrived and organizing their uh, deportation to Mauritania, where they would then be deported uh, farther afield. Um, it then kind of expanded outwards, um, but only for coastal surveillance purposes. So you would have um, helicopters uh, patrolling the coastline, boats, uh, patrolling uh, the, the seas as well for the purposes of uh, detention and um, returning to Mauritanian state territory uh, migrants who had left. Um, that's as direct as it ever got, as far as I can tell. Um, it would only ever be Mauritanian police who physically um, bus people from either Nouadhibou or Nouakchott to the southern border. It wouldn't ever be, as of yet, a Frontex uh, agent doing it. Um, I would suggest that the outcome is the same, because when you look at the breakdown of the outcomes of the HERA operations, you see that there is uh, a certain amount of money that the operation costs. You see that there were a certain amount of experts who were deployed, and you see that there is a certain amount of boats or planes uh, that are used, and that they list the numbers of migrants who were um, deported as a result of these operations. So the numbers of people who were deported, even if they're not being physically removed uh, by Frontex officials, these numbers are still um, viewed as a, um, a positive outcome um, by Frontex. So um, that's the direct, uh, the indirect rather role that I would say that they um, play in that regard. Uh, thank you, Hassan. Um, uh, just to, oh, Jane, you want to add on this question? Uh, yes, I think I can give a small update from the last um, three years, um, specifically about um, Frontex coordinated return operations from Spain. Um, so just give me a moment. Sorry, I just moved my spreadsheet. Um, so in 2019, so this is um, it wouldn't I don't have the information on where in Spain. Um, that we can probably speculate about that. Um, in two, so I have information from 2019 to 2021. Um, so Frontex coordinated the um, deportation of 146 people from Spain to Mauritania in 2019, um, 184 in 2020 and 13 in 2021. Um, so that's my most up-to-date information. So that will be about joint return operations um, or even national return operations. So it will have been instigated by Spain, um, perhaps at a suggestion from Frontex, but it will have been Spain's um, decision and Frontex will have assisted in the coordination of the, of the flight. 
Thank you, Jane. And I mean, perhaps it's common knowledge, but just to, to, to add that Frontex is the key actor in the EU um, to organize voluntary return and deportation. So um, that's now part of its mandate. And when it comes to voluntary returns, in uh, uh, northern africa so the iom again is a key player because they get money from the european union to organize this so-called um wallet voluntary return Magda could tell you a lot about this but i would now pass on to leonie first Leonie, there was a question on uh, the data sharing between uh, senegalese authorities and frontex so can you uh, um, uh, elaborate a bit more uh, on this what type of data is shared and who collects it, etc. PP. Thank you very much, Andreas, and also thank you for the question. So I assume, um, I think, can you, Mike? Yeah, okay, now I'm back, kind of. Um, so I assume the question is um, linked to the data sharing that is happening in the framework of the POC program um because that is where i mentioned it and there you have um as i said in the presentation um police officers stationed at this division and from what i understood in my research is that it's really like operational um cooperation information exchange that enables and facilitates police to police cooperation and um i think in order to enhance this police cooperation also among west african states there we have the netcop progress program the netcop pro program where a joint database for investigative purpose is being built up but that data is not going to be shared between west african and european stakeholders um, officially at least um, but among west african um, stakeholders only officially um, and other than that I'm not aware of any data sharing arrangements um, between Frontex um, and West African states when it comes to um, data on migrant smuggling there's of course the risk analysis cells um, but there is more um, there is more um, um, strategic data so it's more data that would help them analyze um, the situation apologies for my camera um, yeah I hope that answers your question yeah uh, thank you very much uh, Leonie it was Luca's question and um, not mine and uh, Mariana now uh, we are coming um, uh, to you there was a question on the seahorse project um, um, and if the CS project is um, operative in Senegal also, could you tell us a bit more about that? Thank you. I'm afraid I cannot speak specifically um, about that and I don't have the details of what is going on the ground regarding these, uh, uh, this project, but I can um, reply to, to some of the comments that were mentioned earlier uh, also what you uh, said Andreas about a, a platform for exchange and I see a, a question also about uh, judicial avenues against Frontex which was just posted I will I will comment on this as well so um, first of all regarding the exchange of information such a platform would be essential also regarding the um, the, the 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 lack of transparency that we have been discussing regarding Frontex and that is even more important when we're talking about victims of human rights violations or activists working on these topics that are situated in third countries because these people do not have the right to access to documents that Europeans or third country nationals present in the EU have and this is a, a, a very big legal gap that was not covered when the operations of Frontex were extended to third countries. So having such a such a platform would allow people that are situated in Europe to share that information also with uh, the, the stakeholders in, in West African countries. Um, that is what uh, we could do regarding the, um, the gap in social accountability. Uh, Tineke and her colleagues at the parliament are working already on the political accountability 
and there is also the EU Ombudsman uh, with respect to administrative accountability that are very that is very active. Um, they haven't said anything specific on third countries, so that but this is an avenue as well that uh, we could pursue. Uh, now, with respect to judicial accountability, uh, this is a, a a very difficult issue, becoming even more difficult when we're talking about third countries. And the um, the reason for that is not only the immunity from persecution from prosecution that we have uh, discussed so much. So, just to give a little bit of context, the uh, Frontex deployed personnel or personnel that will be deployed in Senegal and Mauritania will be exempted from uh, uh, criminal and civil prosecution. But uh, this already comes to to um, uh, link to the overall problem of holding uh, the agency accountable, even when it's operating in the EU. So we have um, different um, levels of difficulty that have to do with the multiplicity of actors involved and the division of responsibility. Um, it is also difficult to find a, a, a court because only the Court of Justice of the European Union would be responsible for dealing um, with accountability with the judicial accountability of Frontex and that is not very open to looking at situations of shared responsibility and we have most recently the first action for damages against Frontex that was dismissed by the Court of Justice and this is not the only case however today uh, it was I think it was it, no tomorrow another case uh, an action of damages is being uh, heard by the, the Court of Justice, and we'll see what will happen there. But I'm just saying there are steps that are happening. Uh, still, it's very difficult to hold the agency accountable in, uh, in with its operations in the EU, let alone outside the EU. Thank you. Okay. Um, and I apologize you. for the, the lack of light. It's quite late here in the Netherlands, and they, they, they sent us away from our offices, so I had to find another place at the university. <laughs> no that problem does not have light. <laughs> Thank you, Mariana. Um, uh, there is another. There's a question on colonial continuity uh, in the externalization practices. So I would direct the connected question to Mokdar and Salyu. So the question is how knowledge uh, knowledge production of migration could be fostered among African activists and states to stop the high level level of colonial uh, continuity and colonial um, you know, knowledge production in migration policies. Mokdan Zaliyu, do you want to comment on this question? Um. <laughs> Ok. Um, si j'ai compris la question sur la production du savoir. Well, uh, the question was about knowledge production, production and which role this could play. I would say yes, certainly yes, knowledge production taking into account the perspective of the people from the south and activists on the field, this knowledge production should not come from the north or from uh, uh, universities. Yet the issue of migration and the movements have to be taken into account in a comprehensive perspective and uh, encompassing various perspectives, as many as possible. Because today we see that mostly Europeans are interested and the work on migration issues, wealth production, publications in journals, etc., reflect that. In other words, local population, it's not about their interests, it's about the fact that they're not informed and not uh, made part of it. And therefore, this is indeed an extension of a colonial way of uh, dealing with uh, the issues as far as those problems relevant to the world are being dealt with from a northern perspective. So a good way would be to encompass knowledge production 
emerging from the global south and also African country and the global south in general should be actively involved because at the moment there is a multiple production of knowledge within activist movements that is not being used and uh, valued. Often, media researchers use information and work together pro with activists but they do not reflect uh, the uh, viewpoint of activists on the field. So there should be means, uh, or we should use means to grasp and seize uh, their perspectives of those activists on the field, if I understood your question. Right, Andrea. Yeah, um, thank you very much. I also posted the question in the chat, but you answered it really correctly. Salyu, do you also want to uh, comment on this question? And afterwards, we'll come to the, to, 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 nearly to the closing of the event. Well, adding to Mokhtar, I could say uh, that it is very important uh, that knowledge is uh, targeted at countries from the global south because a small community produces knowledge and it is not easy, of course. In our countries, people have to deal with everyday uh, issues the situation and sufferings are there. We cannot only be all, not all of us can be dreamers, but you also need people who adapt and who show interest for the development of the situation in order to find solution to remedy the situation. First of all, of course we can understand it because we are part of the system, we're not outside of it. The police Well, we try to understand the situation. Maybe today we try to create international synergies, uh, synergies across countries so that this knowledge production reaches us, but how can we make sure local population show interest for this and how can we extend the fight in Senegal, for example? Well, probably we, our lives are different and we have different perceptions and we need to find ways to make people aware and draw their attention on those issues, first of all, and ask about how this should work, as we said initially. Uh, thank you, Salyu. Um, I would hand over now to for two, but before that, I just want to thank all the speakers a lot for your um, inputs and for the discussion. Um, one plan that I'm, I'm I'm thinking of is to create a kind kind of such a platform, but I mean I I'm not, yeah. But it's still the, the idea is evolving. If you're interested, uh, you can uh, contact me. And um, thank you very much to the interpreters also. Um, uh, you did a really, really great job. And, and with that, I pass over to Fatou. Uh, thank you, 
Andreas. Et merci, merci à tout le monde. Well, thank you. Uh, we thank all of you for the explanations and inputs. And after two hours of exchange, we hope the discussions and analysis help you and the public and the audience to better understand how Frontex and other players do work and play a role in externalizing the border control towards West Africa and also which consequences and repercussions uh, their actions have on people's movement, freedom of movement, and uh, also how a strong the emergency is to defend people's rights in the sub-region. We also hoped that all inputs helped you to better understand how vital freedom of movement is for the social survival of uh, those population in West Africa. Many thanks to all speakers and participants for those questions you asked, for those answers you brought, and we hope to share other fruitful exchange sessions in a very near, a very close future. Thank you very much for coming here tonight, and we wish you a very nice evening. See you and goodbye.